Uh, we'll get started in 1 Samuel, where we've been for a while, where we'll continue to be. Uh, these are incredible passages. Uh, as many of you guys have been sharing with me in your reading, uh, you're finding God meeting you and challenging you and calling you in incredible ways. And so uh, my prayer has been that that would continue to happen for us. Uh, when I was serving as a youth pastor, uh, I hosted a parent meeting one time where I showed a PBS documentary called The Merchants of Cool. And, and this documentary took a, a fascinating look at youth culture. And specifically, it was exploring whether companies like MTV were the ones creating youth culture, or if companies like MTV were merely learning about youth culture from teenagers and so then trying to sort of give it to them. One of the most interesting parts of uh, this documentary revolved around the discovery that the entertainment industry had developed a, a standard cookie cutter male and female character that was, was showing up in everything that the industry produced. The documentary described the stock male character this way. He is infantile and boorish. A perpetual adolescent, crude and angry. As a 20-something-year-old male at the time, I, I connected with this description of these stock male characters. Right? All it took was a quick look at, at my list of favorite movies over the last several years to see that they were all filled with this, these sorts of infantile, crude, perpetually adolescent characters. Right? These, cons these characters are consistently played by the same cast of man boys. Jim Carrey and Adam Sandler and Will Ferrell and Johnny Knoxville and Seth Rogen. Right? These are the staples in the industry. And, and I had come across this documentary and this idea about the same time that I, I had begun digging into uh, research on adolescent development. And researchers had started to say things like the average male is not developing consistently adult behaviors, consistently adult attitudes, and consistently adult relationships until about 28 years old. These researchers had begun talking about a phenomenon that they were calling the lengthening of adolescence. They were describing the perpetually adolescent adult. Right, physically and numerically an adult, but mentally and emotionally somewhere short of that. As I'm coming across all of this, I'm realizing, oh, these are like my favorite characters in everything I watch. <laughs> but this was also the character that I loved to play. I would go to youth ministry conferences and I would discover that this is the character that churches love to hire as youth pastors. Right, because what better to, way to relate to teenagers than to have someone who looks like an adult, but who, who seems to belong in their world. Right? And so I, I built my, my youth ministry career on being adult enough to convince parents that they could trust me, but childish enough that teenagers thought I was super cool and fun. There, there are two reasons why that I want us to read this morning's passage, to hear this morning's passage with this image of the perpetual adolescent in our minds. The first is really simple. The Bible uh, is pro-growing up. Uh, it is without question interested in humans, boys and girls learning and growing and developing setting aside childish things and pressing on toward the full and the abundant life of adulthood. And our passage this morning shows us what this kind of maturing looks like in a real person facing real challenges. David, the second reason for us to keep in mind MTV's perpetual adolescent is this. We have to understand how intensely our culture resists this kind of growth. How adamantly our culture opposes this kind of growth that scripture calls us to. It's not just boys. Uh, 
We as a culture are obsessed with youth. We are desperate to stay young, to look young, to feel young. Last week I described the tension. The tension that exists between rival kingdoms. There is a real tension between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God with regard to the goals of our life. And and so the question that that these kingdoms, these rival kingdoms pose for us is this. Do we have any interest in growing up as mature adults, mature in the faith, or... Are we clinging to our youth as though immaturity were a value in God's kingdom? This rivalry between kingdoms, it continues in our passage this morning. This rivalry we started with last, we started to explore last week continues as David is confronted with his own immaturity. He's confronted with his own lack of wisdom and his own impulsiveness. We heard it in the story we just read. See, while David, though, is busy facing all of his own inner stuff, uh, he's also then confronted by, by the person who would tempt him to remain a boy. Will David seek the Lord, or will he follow Saul's path? See, because Saul, as we've uh, discovered, is uh, emotionally unstable, he's impulsive, He's irresponsible, and he is a self-obsessed man-boy, stuck in a state of arrested development. But he's more dangerous than that because he is violently opposed to the person that God is growing up in David. He would seek to end David's life. And so the question becomes, will David walk a new path or will David walk Saul's path? Will David seek Saul's end in return or will David seek to heap good upon Saul's evil? This morning we're going to look at David's growth through a fairly long uh, passage. Uh, So clearly we're not going to be able to read it all. We heard chapter uh, 25 this morning. Uh, You can imagine how much longer it is, 21 through 26. This actually becomes one of those places where using the daily worship guide through the week is really valuable. Um, If you sort of have these stories in your mind already, uh, some of the references may be a bit more accessible immediately. But what I want to suggest is that these five chapters are really about two experiences, two crisis experiences for David, where where in each instance he must uh, decide whether he will learn and whether he will grow. Or will he settle, saying, well, this is who I am. This is who I've always been. And just be cool with staying the same. He can either become the man that God made him to be, or he can accept his his immaturity and say, this is just who I am. This is me being truly authentic. It's important to then also say this as we think about these five chapters. David is in a particular place. Everything that happens to David in these five chapters happens in the wilderness. It's essential for us to understand that this is all happening in the wilderness because before the wilderness, what was David's life like? Well, David was living in Saul's royal court. It was pretty good. David had a place of service right next to the king. David's best friend was the king's son. David's wife was the king's daughter. David was a general or a commander in the king's army. David was, pos- was perfectly positioned to assume his God-given throne the moment Saul either stepped aside or, or died. But one of the things I love about uh, God as he reveals himself to us in his word is that God doesn't seem to care that much about perfect positions or at least uh, what seem to be perfect positions from our standpoint, because there David is perfectly positioned, but God doesn't push Saul aside. God doesn't strike Saul dead just because David is inches from the throne. God seems content to make David wait. But God makes David do more than wait. 
Because God lets Saul become so violently unstable that David is forced to leave his perfect position, to go far from the throne that should be his out into the wilderness. And, and the wilderness is about as far from perfect as, as you could hope for, right? David is now disconnected from all of his military friends, all of his political connections. David has left behind his wife. He has left behind his best friend. David left without food, without even a weapon to defend himself. In chapter 21, these are the things we find David looking for. Chapter 22 then tells us that, that the only support David has is his family and uh, a group of outcasts. We don't know because the text doesn't tell us if David's family like wanted to go with him, if they wanted to follow him. But it would seem that they don't have much choice, right? Saul is a bit too unpredictable to believe that they might be safe. And so they go. Uh, but then there's this group beyond David's family. A ragtag group has gathered around David. Uh, in chapter 22, verse 2, David's army, and I call it an army because he's described as the commander of this group. But it's not much of an army. It's summed up as everyone who is in distress, and everyone who is in debt, and everyone who is bitter in soul, these <laughs> are the ones who gathered around David. Right. Just the group you want when you're, you're looking to build a kingdom, right? The other thing that David runs into the wilderness with is some sense of, of lingering doubt, questions about whether David may have squandered his perfect position pop up. In chapter 24, right before the, the Abigail and Nabal story, David finds himself once again just inches from the king's throne. So close he can literally smell it. Literally, if you read the Daily Worship Guide this weekend, you know this story. Uh, David is hiding in a cave, and when Saul comes in to go, number two, he finds himself a throne in this cave. And while Saul is going, David cuts off the corner of his robe. That's how close David got to him. And it's in that moment that David is, is legitimately tempted by the, the idea that it, that it is time. It is his time. God has put him once again in the perfect position. He won't make the same mistake he made last time. He is going to take advantage of this moment. But then something happens in his heart. All of this wilderness talk pushes us to recognize that the context for David's growth is discomfort and displacement. If there is anything that Americans seek above all else, it's not our freedom, it's our comfort. We live in a culture that does not value growing up. And that is in part because we do not live in a culture that values the discomfort of the wilderness. We, as a people, desperately look to escape challenging seasons, right? The wilderness brings out our, our hardest, most fervent praying. But this praying often uh, is not that God might change us or use us or use the wilderness to transform our character. It's not often that, that we would find contentment in the wilderness, but we often pray in the wilderness that God would take us from the wilderness as quickly as possible. In this wilderness, we plead with God to end our hardship and to restore our palace comforts. God seems to understand that, that if David is going to have the best shot at serving as a good and faithful king, and, and now mind you, God has already said that's impossible for any human being other than himself to do. But if David's going to serve the stand a chance at it, it will be because he has learned, it will be because he has grown, and he is becoming a, a maturing human adult. Maturity cannot be acquired in the palace. 
David will learn that the moment he gets into the palace and finds how easy it is to, to slide into comfort. Maturity is found in the wilderness. And David has these two wilderness experiences that, that we should recognize. We should recognize them because they are familiar to us. Because David is tempted by the same things the Israelites were tempted by in the wilderness. And, and these are the same temptations that Jesus then faced when the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And these are the same temptations that we face when we are found in the wilderness. In fact, these temptations are actually a good indication to us that maybe we are in the wilderness, right? If, if you go, well, am I in the wilderness? If you're experiencing this, these temptations, you might be. Uh, it's likely that you are. And these, these temptations can be sort of seen with, with these questions. Will you trust yourself to provide for yourself? Uh, will you trust yourself to protect yourself? And will you take for yourself authority? that has not been given to you. These are the temptations of the wilderness. These are the temptations that the Israelites face, that David faces, that Jesus faces, and that we face. In each of these, we, we suggest what, sit, what kingdom that we are citizens of, what king we trust. David's uh, first of, two, of the two wilderness experiences revolves around David's need for provision and for protection. He runs from the safety of Saul, if you can call it safety, uh, the comfort of Saul's uh, court. And first thing he's looking for is protection and provision. And then David's second experience is ultimately about, about his rights. The rights that David may or may not have to certain aspects of God's reign and authority. Right? David's been told he's king. What does that mean? What is he free to do? H how much authority has he been given? What does it mean for David to be king? These are the, the questions that he wrestles with there. And so you have provision, and you have protection, and you have authority, and all of these tempt David in the wilderness, and they tempt him in similar ways. Because in both of these experiences, we see as a, a familiar pattern. And, and again, it's a pattern that we should recognize because it's a pattern that, that we live out in our lives all the time. The pattern is really simple. David, he makes a decision or, or he takes an action of some sort. And during that moment, something happens that causes David to start wondering whether he has done the right thing. And at some point down the road, David is confronted sort of fully and openly with the truth. And it's in that moment that he realizes that he has made a mistake. He understands that he had been wrong. This is the point where Saul's kingdom and David's kingdom depart. Both Saul and David make mistakes. But, but Saul and David respond to their mistakes in radically different ways. David is no super holy man defined by his, his sinlessness. Right? So, Often, and I've heard it in our small group and in other small groups, we're occasionally offended by David. Uh, maybe often offended by David. And uncomfortable with what it means to call David a man after God's own heart because it turns out that, that he sins more than we're comfortable with. What makes David a holy man, a holy man after God's own heart, is, is what he does in light of his sin. See, Saul is no more a sinner than David. But what sets Saul apart as the ruler of darkness, uh, that Saul, in, in Saul's story, he, he experiences the heck out of the light. The light keeps bumping up against him, but he never steps into it. He never repents. He never steps out of the darkness. I mean, consider just for a second Saul's list of experiences with the light. Saul has a prophet come to him and say, and, and say I have a word from God for you. Saul has a public event, like many, many people there, where God publicly picks him in front of all of these people to be Israel's first king. Saul then has this profound spiritual experience where God's spirit comes upon him and he begins to prophesy uh, miraculously. In fact, this happens twice to him. God gives Saul a new heart 
God uses Saul to lead Israel into victorious battle. Saul receives sign after sign, confirmation after confirmation that God is with him as he promised he would be. Saul even receives the comforting ministry of of God's spirit at work through another person with him. I mean, this list is ridiculous. I think most of us would say, I would give my entire life to God if I would never stop following him, if I had one of those things. Experience after experience marks Saul's life, and yet Saul remains the same. He never grows. He never matures. His responses look exactly the same, one to the next. So one of the things that we learn by reading Saul's story is that experiencing God is never enough to sustain a life devoted to following God. Experiences with God are never sufficient to sustain this kind of life. Submission to God is necessary. Ongoing submission to God is a key part of a life of discipleship. And key to that is repentance. Repentance is required. And this is where David steps out. This is where David lives out this desire to seek God and grow, right? Because David, he recognizes his mistakes. He admits that he was wrong and that he thought wrongly about about what was going on. But then he remains open to this ongoing work that is required to actually change, to change your life, to change your behaviors. He allows God to keep working in him. He understands that this is a gift of grace that God wants to give him to transform him. And ultimately... David demonstrates transformation in his life and in his body. This is one of the differences between Saul and David. See, Saul keeps showing up in scenes, and he is not ashamed to publicly announce that he has been wrong. Right? You catch this about Saul. There are several times where he he says in front of lots of people, I was wrong. I've seen the error of my ways. Everything will be different from now on. David rarely stands up and makes these kinds of public proclamations. Instead, he just lives differently. And so we consider the first of David's experiences to see how that plays out. Chapter 21, uh, David has just fled into the desert. And he goes straight for the place that has both food and a sword. Because when we face trouble... Don't we all sort of take stock of where we might go, where we might turn to? Uh, Apocalyptic uh, movies and TVs are kind of a big deal right now. And so like one of my running jokes is that if if the end comes, right, if if we experience some sort of apocalyptic uh, cataclysmic event, right, where we have no electricity, we have nothing, there are three people that I am going to hunt down and find, and they're going to be part of my, my survival party. Uh, Jim Fricking is one, just so you guys know. Alex Emerson is one, and then Garrett Law. Some of you guys know him. But I'm coming to find you guys, and we're sticking together. You, you're going to protect me. Um, so, <laughs> right, but there's a sense in which we, we, we think about the possibilities of what could be coming. Uh, sorry, the rest of you. You all have valuable uh, you know, contributions, too, but... Yeah, if you can keep up, then you... <laughs> uh, <ooh>. um, <laughs> we, right, but we, we see possibilities down the road, and it's hard to not sort of create plan Bs. What would I do in this scenario? And I want to suggest that, that by going to the sanctuary at, at Nob, David is relying on his own wisdom what he knows uh, to meet his needs and to defend himself, right? The key detail in this story, or I should should say the missing detail in this story is that, that David doesn't inquire of the Lord. David leaves Saul's court and he goes directly to, to the sanctuary at Nob. And the reason that this is, is noteworthy is because as the story unfolds, as these chapters keep going, David will discover that there are consequences to the decision that he made at Nob to ask Ahimelech for help. And there'll be serious consequences. 
an entire city of priests and their families will be massacred by Saul because of what David has done. Immediately after this, in chapter 23, David will inquire of God. He will seek the Lord. He will go to the Lord before he goes anywhere else. The very next thing that David does after this whole uh, first story is, is seek God about something. This is so significant, significant because we are being shown David, the man who learns from his mistakes, the man who grows, the man who seeks after God, who occasionally forgets to in the midst of crisis or desperation, how many of us know that experience? But he's, he's learned from that, and he, be, and he goes right to the Lord at this point. God tells David to go and to help these people of a town uh, named Kayla. And once he's there, David isn't done seeking God. He inquires of the Lord again to find out what's going to happen. And God gives him another answer. God... David in this has gone from survival mode, uh, relying on himself, seeking his own wisdom, to now seeking the Lord about every decision, every possibility. You see what, what's happened. You see the way that grace has transformed David's life. Until finally, David in this town of Kayla escapes from danger. And in verse 14, the very last verse of this section, we find that Saul has been chasing David from place to place to place. Uh, but we're told that God did not give David into Saul's hand. And so, and so a summary, the, the flow of, of this first story is that David doesn't seek God's guidance. And in his own wisdom, searching for food and for a sword, he creates a deadly situation for God's priests. But David faces his sin. He confesses it and he changes his behavior so that David then seeks the Lord's counsel. And in the process, it turns out God's people are blessed and God actually uh, takes care of David. David is growing up in the Lord. We should notice something about the consequences of David's actions. Because our actions always have consequences, right? David does two things that are, that are utterly essential if we are going to grow up in the Lord. And so turn with me to, to uh, chapter 22, verse uh, 20. One of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Abiathar comes to David and is exactly right. Saul may have been too afraid to kill uh, the priests of the Lord himself, but Saul holds complete responsibility for the deaths because he was the one who standing in front of them ordered it. He was the one who asked Doeg to go through with this. He is the one who is responsible. I don't think anybody would read this and say, no, Saul's not, Saul's not responsible. Somebody else is. But David won't let Saul hold responsibility alone. This is so amazing, right? David says nothing about Saul. He says nothing about Saul's place in the priest's death. In verse 22, David says, I knew on that day. Doeg, the, the Edomite, was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons in your father's house. I mean, maybe you think that David is going a bit too far here. Maybe you think David is, just, is being a bit dramatic, but he's not. David is doing what a man after God's own heart does. He acknowledges that in the moment that he went and saw Ahimelech, he knew that something was wrong. He saw Doeg there and he had a feeling. This might turn out poorly. And then when it did, 
David understood who was to blame. See, he said, had David sought God's counsel, had David not raced to know the nearest food and sword drive through, uh, Saul would never have had occasion, would never have had reason to kill these priests and their families. The only reason Saul had any uh, interest in these people were because of David's actions in going to them. And I can tell you how important this is. In a culture where nobody wants to grow up, people do not take responsibility for their decisions. Right? Children blame each other for stuff. Right? Young children are incapable of what psychologists call perspective taking. This is a learned mental process that requires, that indicates some sort of maturity and growth. But think about children. All they know is the harm that's been done to them by their sibling. And so they rise up and they point their finger and they yell, he did it. And you say, but you. And they say, no, but he. <laughs> David isn't worried about blaming Saul. Even though Saul is the one who is directly responsible for the deaths of the priests, David is concerned with, his, with understanding his part in it taking responsibility for it, and learning from this mistake. This is huge. Uh, some time ago, a lo long time ago, a, a person um, came to me, asked me for pas pastoral help specifically, with a conflict that they were experiencing with someone else uh, that I have a pastoral relationship with. And they asked if I'd be willing to listen and help and this is a person, and these two people were experiencing conflict, and I, I listened, and I asked questions as, as the person shared with me their perspective on, on what had happened. And so when they were finished, I, I asked, so what can you learn about your part in this conflict? Uh, what did you contribute to what, what happened? How can you uh, respond differently the next time? I found out a few weeks later that this person was... Uh, pretty angry with me because in their perspective I hadn't taken their side but it turns out Saul killed the priests in Nob because he thought that they were taking David's side side taking is dangerous business among rival kingdoms and as a pastor my work isn't in side taking that is the work of Saul's kingdom the kingdom of God is about helping people find ways to glorify God with their lives, which means I will rarely let someone get away with blaming others for something they had a part in. Growth as human beings never comes. It never comes from finding blame in other people, for being able to point out other people's faults. It only ever comes from taking responsibility for our own actions. Which means that while I may not have taken this person's side, I was acting for their good. It, it, just not in the way that they wanted me to. They had no idea what kinds of conversations I was having on the side with the other person. Uh, they had no idea the ways I was encouraging the other person to do their part to make things right. Because it wasn't their place to know. It was their place to acknowledge their own sin and repent and take responsibility and do their part to be reconciled just as this other person had that same responsibility. This is the work that we find Abigail doing in, in chapter 25. It's amazing how often we reject the Abigails that come to us and seek to correct us. From either David or Nabal's perspective, they could have looked at what Abigail was doing and they could have seen her as taking sides, right? But she's not, right? She's calling David to be the kind of man that God made him to be. She's calling David to live within the boundaries of God's anointing. And she's advocating for Nabal, a fool who is acting unwisely. There are a million cultural reasons that David had to not listen to, to Abigail. 
but a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart, is eager to learn. And David is confronted with the truth about his actions, and he listens, and he responds. Chapter 26 then shows David in the exact same situation he faced in chapter 24. It's, it's weird. Uh, if you pick up a commentary on 1 Samuel, uh, commentators just seem to be bashing their heads against the wall trying to understand what's going on. Because in chapter 24 and chapter 25, you have really similar accounts of, of David coming close to Saul, um, having an opportunity to, to kill Saul, but then not. And you should hear or read these commentators try to explain what's happening. Uh, but in light of chapter 25, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. The, the authors are making clear to us that David is a growing human being. That, that in chapter 26, he understands his role. He understands the Lord's anointing, the Lord's purpose in a way he didn't in chapter 24. And he understands it now because of what's happened in chapter 25. Right? This is how gr growth works. He understands because of Abigail's faithfulness in calling him to be the man that God made him to be. And David lives as this growing, maturing man, acting in altogether different ways than he did before. In the first instance, he was close to taking Saul's life. In the second instance, he is confident that that is not his job, that that is the Lord's job alone, and that he is but a servant of the true king. The last thing that David did uh, when Abiathar, the lone massacre survivor, comes to him is David says to this man, you belong to me now. Not in a, not in a possession sort of way, in a care sort of way. This is amazing, right? David's desire to make things right, to, to see justice done, doesn't stop at saying he was sorry. See, Saul excelled in apologies. David takes Abiathar and he promises to care for him. He promises to keep him secure with him. David isn't willing to let Saul finish what he started. And so he owns the consequences of his decision. And this is such an important part of growing up for all of us. It's, a, it's one thing to make a mistake and to own it, but it's another to invest ourselves in costly ways in the consequences of our actions to, to truly make right what we have made wrong. This is the kind of man that David is becoming in the wilderness. The wilderness invites us to grow up as David did. One of the things that is important for the way that we live our lives together and the way that we worship together is that we hear God's word and we come to the table every single week. And this morning may be more important than many mornings to come to the table uh, because uh, when we hear a message like this, a call to grow up, a, a call to mature, a call to develop, it would be really easy for us to, sort of, to, to do exactly what David did, which is then uh, go sort of seek this out on our own and try to sort of muscle up our own uh, growth. Um, but growth is a gift of grace. And we come to the table week after week to be reminded that our lives are drenched in the grace of God. We, we, we only grow because God has given us his spirit. We only grow because God has given us his word. We only grow because God is so invested in us as his people that he would send his own son to show us life and to give us life through his death and through his resurrection. And so it's important 
When we hear a message calling us to grow as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, to grow in Christ's likeness, that we don't somehow think that this is something we are capable of doing apart from God. But our growth actually is about getting better and learning to seek God more consistently and more faithfully, recognizing uh, that God is not far off, but that God has come near. And God's promise, as he gives it at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, is that it doesn't matter how far you think God might be, uh, but God has promised to be with us until the end of the age. And this is good news. This is grace.